So welcome those that are showing up. Let's give it maybe a couple more minutes and um, let's see how it goes. Uh, this is an opportunity certainly for all of you to interact with us. So feel free to either, you know, you can put your video on if you'd like, um, unmute yourself, ask questions um, as we go through our talk. Hey, Lauren. So uh, I was just saying a little hello, welcome here as we kind of get ready to go. Um, just a couple things for me. I just wanted to say hello. Just I know a few of you were on. I do have to run to another meeting. So I'm going to actually leave the meeting. And uh, my name is Eric Ruggiero, if you have not met me. <laughs> Um, my colleagues, Lisa Reynolds and Andy Wren, professors, are going to take over and guide you through this session in an incredible way. So please, um, as I get off the, uh, off the call, um, interact, ask questions. Uh, anything you need to know about our department and us, you should ask in the process. There will be time at the end for Q&A uh, or in between. You know, jump in at any time. So how are you feeling about that? You all right? Sounds good. Okay, I think. So I, I like to hear at least a voice now and then. I feel great. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm going to get on my other meeting um, as we start this, and I will jump in if I can uh, whenever. And thank you for coming and welcome. And, um, you know, I'd just like to say just briefly how um, – Exceptionally proud we are of our faculty, staff, and students for continuing on in, in an as uninterrupted way as we can. So accolades go out to our team. And um, from there, I'm going to say goodbye and introduce uh, Professor Reynolds um, to take you through the rest. So I'll see you guys. See ya. <laughs> I was about to say hi, everybody, but there's only two people so far. Um, so I'm wondering if we should give it a few minutes. Um, there, the admissions office told us we were looking at about eight guests today. Um, so I want to give it a couple minutes before we get started. Um, but while we're here and while we're kind of waiting for everybody, um, because of the format that we're in, is anyone joining us from, from like, where, are we, where are you guys joining us from? Where is everybody coming from? I'm pretty close. I live in Old Forge. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not, I'm not too, too far. <laughs> yeah, not crazy. What's that? Was that April, I believe? No. Okay. Lost in... Oh, it's me. My audio is cutting out. I'm from upstate New York. Oh, cool. All right. We have a lot of students from upstate New York. That seems to be a place where, where we're drawing from quite a bit lately. So that's exciting. Um, one of our senior, like one of our, actually one of our graduating seniors right now is from um, upstate New York. She lives on the border of New York, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, God, I can't remember the name of the town. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're heading up north quite a bit these days. I'm from um, way up. I'm from Syracuse, almost. Oh, man, that is far. <laughs> She's from the border. That's downstate. That is not upstate yeah, New York. You guys would consider that downstate, wouldn't you? Oh, my god. Very goodness. much so. I consider the only time I was ever in Syracuse, we went to a basketball game at, at the Carrier Dome. Yeah. And you park in a different lot, and then they, like, shuttle you to the, to the dome. And while we were in the game, it snowed, covered... <laughs> all of the cars in the parking lot. So when we got back to where our car was, you couldn't tell which car was which. <laughs> yeah, that's usually how it goes. <laughs> so we're literally walking around the parking lot, like wiping off every single car, just trying to figure out what it was. It was a crazy oh, yeah. day. It was a crazy, crazy day. Oh my goodness. Um, so now are you guys, I know some people are committed so far. Are you guys, are you, have you guys made your decisions yet? Or are you still sort of looking at schools and things like that? I sent my money in a couple days ago, so. Oh, no. Okay, cool. So you're called, we, we're, you're what we call a deposit. So now we, <laughs> now we know you're coming. Um, what about you, Nathan? Have you, are you looking at other schools still or have you sort of made your choice, you think? 
Uh, I, I certainly definitely haven't made my choice 100% yet. Yeah. Same. But uh, it's definitely coming soon, though. I can tell you that. It's It's got to be a lot more difficult the way all this yeah, is it happening. Is. Yeah, because well, you yeah, probably didn't get to I, do the visits you wanted to do. Or, no. You know. No, I was only able to go visit, like, LCC. Mm, that was about it. I was going to go visit Johnson's and then you guys, but, you know. So you've not been to our campus. Everything that happened. I I think I was there once a really long time ago, but not yeah. like officially or anything. It's changed quite a bit, and and I mm. think that you know since you're local, if you're bored, take a drive through. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you you're know not what far. I mean. You can at least at least sort of see it. We, we're this is our we're, we're looking good this in the spring, so um, definitely take a swing through. I'm actually going to go ahead and get started, um, and if, if other folks jump in, we can sort of stop, but one of the things we wanted to go through really quickly today with you um, was something that the students learn really early on um, here at Wilkes in our program. Um, I tend to teach a lot of foundational classes, um, so I'm someone that you'll work with quite a bit if, as a freshman and, and as a sophomore. Um, and one of the things we focus on a lot as freshmen, with, with our students as freshmen, is to heighten your awareness of the visual world around you, to start to look at things and absorb things that you otherwise might not pay attention to. Um, because it's those things that we end up making. So we, we look at as much creative work as possible, and that doesn't always necessarily mean design, and that doesn't always necessarily mean art. It can mean any number of different sort of mediums. Um, as Dr. Ren will, will tell us a little bit later, uh, one of our new things that we have here is a minor in what's called emergent technologies, which is going to involve a lot. It opens up a, a completely new world of sort of ways to use our skills and ways to use design and creative thinking and creative processes. Um, so really, really early on, your freshman year, you're just looking at a lot of stuff. We're, we're looking at work, we're talking about work, we're learning the terms. Um, and we're trying to figure out what makes those things successful designs or, or good, quote unquote, good. Um, and a big misconception that people have about art or studying anything creative is that you just sort of have to have it, right? Like you just sort of have to be creative or be talented in that way. Um, either you are or you're not. This is wildly untrue. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk to you about some of the very specific creative concepts um, that we that we teach and latch on to and can sort of revisit and go back to every time we're trying to figure out why something is designed effectively. There are reasons. There's actually 10 of them that we're going to look at. And we're going to go through them a lot more quickly and a lot more briefly than we would. But this is normally something that, uh, that we teach in the beginning of your sophomore year, actually. You, you would take a class called IM201. Um, that's, I teach both sections of that as of right now. And um, this is when we, we learn the basic sort of building block fundamentals of design. And I use the word design and very specifically not graphic design because that's not what we're doing here. We're not just doing graphic design. Uh, we're doing design with a capital D. So that involves, uh, that can involve anything and everything from print materials, furniture, um, websites, you know, video games, business cards, logos, it, it's, it sort of runs the gamut. So it's all visual thinking. It's all sort of visual problem solving. So I'm actually, I don't know how, how experienced you guys are with Zoom. Um, I'm new, I'm new to it, but I'm getting better at it. And one of the cool features that we can do is called share screen. So I'm going to grab the screen right now. Um, it, you'll still see thumbnails of Dr. Ren and myself. Um, as well as you guys should you choose. Um, but for now, I'm gonna sort of take over your screens and I'm going to bring up a little presentation um, that we have prepared. So I'm gonna share the screen. I'm actually gonna share Adobe Acrobat and I am going to do full screen mode. Okay, so Dr. Ren, do you see the word Unity? Yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure that my screen is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So as I said, there are 10 basic principles that, that sort of tie together design and they're, they're identifiable aspects that as we look at work and as we look at creative work, we can see and track what it is about it that's making it successful. The first one we're going to talk about is unity. And what you'll find is a lot of these principles need one another to function. So uh, one called variety is going to very quickly follow unity. 
Um, but unity is where we're starting. So unity is the force within a work of art, which can give the appearance of oneness, resolution, or consistency. Um, so that's a big, fancy academic definition. So what does that look like in real life and in practice? Um, so this is a simple little illustration. Um, we're going to see this illustration a couple of times because it, it demonstrates a couple of these design principles that we're talking about today. Um, and you can see that what is being represented here is a flock of birds, a group of birds, right? We know it's not the exact same bird because they're different colors. We know that there's some depth in the plane. We know that this is sort of a little, it's meant to be a little bit three dimensional because some of them are smaller and some of them are bigger. Um, we know that this is meant to be fun and exciting because there's a lot of bright colors, but the things that are varied in this, in this image are also countered by the unification of those images. We know that they're the same type of bird because of the way they're illustrated. We know that they're a flock of birds because they're represented together in a group. Um, we know that they're the same kind of bird because they all have the same kind of home, right? We know that birds of different types have different types of nests and homes. Um, so it's all of these sort of factors, the, the, the color scheme, the illustration style, and the shape and rendering of the homes for the birds are what creates that unity. It's what creates that, that these birds are now all perceived as a group because of the characteristics that we have assigned to them, that we've chosen for them. And that's design. Our choices of colors, our choices of positions and proportions and sizes, all of those are design decisions that we're making. So our forces onto this illustration are what's making it be perceived as a group. It's unifying. Sometimes it becomes a little bit more vague and a little bit more difficult to identify, but you have the boots, right? So Waiting for Godot is this really cerebral, cool art house film that all the smart people love. Um, and from a visual standpoint, they're using these sort of tired, old, slouchy boots as the representation. That's the, that's the visual concept here. So when they were choosing their typefaces, they opted to not choose something really rigid or something really geometric or something really modern looking. They're using this little wobbly kind of handwritten typeface because it unifies with the wobbly kind of tired look of the boots. Um, it makes the type and the image seem as though they go together. And again, that's design. But this is even in play at really on a really large scale. So right now we're looking at we're looking at a city skyline, right? Beautiful, lit up, very exciting. It, it's a really sort of emotional experience. Those of us that have traveled um, to cities, you know, when you're kind of coming over the bridge or when you're when you're entering into that city setting that that skyline is a really exciting thing um, but if you're an architect designing one of these buildings you're going to be looking at that skyline absolutely in addition to looking at designing your own building because do you want to how are you unifying with the rest of the city how are you unifying with this image um, this this image of the city skyline is not unplanned and it's not a mistake um, the architects are very conscious of where their designs not only fit in their own sort of building in a vacuum, but how it fits in with the world around it. So establishing unity or acknowledging unity is something that designers of all ilks do, not just graphic. So as I said, those principles kind of need to live together and unity and variety are, are, are go hand in hand in many, many instances. Um, so from a definition standpoint, variety is including different elements, colors, shapes, lines, textures, um, and they're used to design to create visual, to create visual interest. They're used to create content that has visual interest. Um, but without, without unity, there oftentimes isn't variety, which is why I'm showing you this image. This is the same image that we saw. So all of those aspects that we talked about that are creating, that are creating unity amongst these birds are also actively working to sort of show the variety because the color scheme, while it is systemic and has a sort of set number of colors, so that unifies it, it's also got different colors. So it's not all blues, it's not all purples, it's not all pinks or yellows. It's a varied color scheme. So we're still creating that playful, fun feeling because we have all these different sort of bright colors, but they're unified in the fact that they have a, a systemic uh, decisions that are being made. So you can see that in many instances, unity and variety 
are very much hand in hand. And then in some cases, you have variety for emphasis. So in this particular case, um, this is a hand-drawn type by a woman named Abby Sam. Um, if you're into hand-drawn type, follow her on Instagram. She's incredible. Um, and, she, or I'm sorry, Lauren Sam. And then there's, a, this is Lauren Sam. Um, there's another girl, they have very similar names. So Lauren Sam, um, she creates these really elaborate hand-drawn type murals for retail restaurants. This is, this is sort of her niche design work. Um, and in order to emphasize certain words and de-emphasize others, what we're finding is she's making decisions. Oh, they're not, they're not moving, Andy? Oh, no. no, it's not moving. It's just showing the first slide. Darn it. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing any of this? Are you guys seeing the slides? Is, is this just the first page? Or? No, I actually have not. Darn it. Okay, shoot, <laughs> shoot, 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 shoot. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the share and then I'm going to reshare and I'm going to try to do it in a different way. Um, I'm going to do desktop instead. All right, so do you guys see the word variety? Yeah. If I click it, oh, wait. Do you see it okay. now? All Let's right, get we're getting there. Yeah, All right, so we'll just pick right up. So this, <laughs> <laughs> so this again, Abby, um, Lauren Sam. Um, she creates these really elaborate typographic murals. And the really exciting thing about these is she's using the, the change in typeface for emphasis here. Um, she's using a, a, a all caps serif typeface um, for the words food and eat with, which are important to the message because it's all about sort of eating together. Um, and then she's using the word handcrafted in your hands to represent something completely different. So that variety in typeface, not using the exact same typeface for all of those images, is helping her to create something that has more visual interest. Um, there's no better example of unity and variety than an infographic. And these become more and more relevant um, as our communication methods change, particularly regarding social media. Many times you guys are probably more used to seeing these animated. Um, so this would be um, this would be a static infographic as opposed to an animated infographic. But what you can see, the way that that a designer is able to keep this from being exceptionally confusing, is by using those ideas of unity and variety. Um, there are unity elements throughout this entire thing in the color scheme, in the typeface choices, um, in the sort of geometric shapes and the, and the little icons that they use to, to represent these ideas. Those are all unified elements. Um, but by deploying them in a systemic way, by making some of them bold and some of them not bold and some of them uppercase and lowercase and some are small and some are big, they're creating a, a variety that's going to keep you interested in the data. Because let's face it, data is super boring, right? So visualizing data is a great way to get people to be interested in it. And it, keeping it interesting, using that variety concept is what's keeping it interesting. Hierarchy is our next one. And hierarchy is, hierarchy is probably one of the most important design elements that we use constantly every single day. Um, and it's one of the easier ones to notice and to, and, to, and to manifest in your own work. So all it really is, is the organization and prioritization of the content um, in a way that's serving the message. So you would see one thing first, you see one thing second, and you see one thing third. And we're manipulating you to do that through size, through position, through the style of the type and through the color. We've made those choices as designers to manipulate the way you see this content um, in a hierarchical fashion. And here we see it in practice. This is a magazine spread. This is, this is a page in a magazine article. So we can see how they're using hierarchy to create the headline and then to, to, to lead you down into the body copy. And then you have the image with the pointed roof that's pointing you back up into more content or information that you want to read. So the way they've arranged this page from a size standpoint, from a color standpoint, and the typeface standpoint, even the eight choices of the images, all of these things are pushing you in a direction of what they want you to read, first, second, and third. Obviously, color is significant here to create hierarchy. I mean, where you go first in any website or web experience is typically the links, it's typically the navigation. That's what you're looking for first. 
Um, but because they want to send a message, they want to tell you something before you get lost into the navigation, they're creating this big giant orange word that draws your attention. And so the hierarchy of this layout becomes going here first and then going to the navigation second. Proportion. This is the one everybody hates because it's really hard to understand sometimes. Uh, but I'm hoping that the images that we're going to look at will clarify it a little bit for you. So proportion is said to be harmonious when a correct or desirable relationship between the elements exists in respect to size, color, quantity, degree, or setting. Again, that's a super academic definition that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook and jargon. So we're going to look at some pictures to try and understand it, which is how I like to learn. I like to learn through looking at images. Um, so when you look at this poster, you see this very big, sort of very motion heavy, very dynamic graphic, right? And then you see quite a bit of white space, and then you see this tiny, teeny word, Beethoven. So Beethoven is probably the most recognizable and most well-known com classical composer in the history of classical music. Um, is he the best? Is he the, the most prolific? Who cares? He's the most well-known. So for our purposes, we know that if we put the word Beethoven on something, we don't necessarily have to make it big giant. We don't necessarily have to put it at the top of something. It carries weight because of who he was. Um, so by making the graphic around it really, really dynamic and really intense and allowing all of this white space to, to enclose the, the pertinent information, we're playing with proportion. We're playing with the word Beethoven compared to the sort of representation of the sound that Beethoven makes, right? That's what these big circles are made to represent. We can all sort of see how that radiating circle situation happens when you're, when you're trying to represent the idea of sound. Um, so the proportion of these big, bold black lines juxtaposed against that teeny tiny lowercase Helvetica Beethoven is a significant point of visual interest that they've created using proportion. So this is an image of a cathedral. Um, and this, it, your religious persuasion or lack thereof does not matter when we're talking about this. What matters is the emotional reaction that somebody has when they go into a church or a cathedral. Um, even if you're not a religious person, we've all experienced walking into a space that's sort of tall and vast and, and endless and much, much bigger than us. And we feel that feeling of intimidation. We feel that feeling of awe, of wonder, of grandiosity. It's, it's an emotionally moving experience, regardless of your faith. Um, churches are designed specifically to be that way. These big sweeping vaulted ceilings and the proportion comparative to you and the building itself is meant to be a representation of God. It's meant to be a representation of this, you know, massive sort of higher power if you're a person of faith. So the the, pers the, the proportion of, of, the, of the user, of the customer, if you will, to the space is very much what creates that emotional, that desired emotional response, that, that, that sort of feeling that you're in a place other than ordinary. You're in a place that's bigger or more important in some capacity than another building that's around you. And then other times proportion is funny. Um, you know, this gigantic fish rolling up on this teeny tiny fisherman would under normal, in this, in this rickety little boat, would under normal circumstances be a real scary thing, right? Because of the proportion, because the fish is so very much bigger than this teeny tiny little delicate guy. Um, but they added this little eye here and they added this sort of friendly little smile on the fish. And what that does is it overcomes the proportion. It's taking the proportion and tempering it and pulling it back. So like the fish looks friendly. He doesn't really look like he's gonna hurt him, even though proportionally he's gigantic and normally would be something scary. Movement, movement has so many different uses. Typically it's used to guide the viewer throughout the piece. Um, but that can mean a lot of different things depending on the piece, depending on the object that we're talking about. Um, this is a gig poster for 
you know, a band um, that's playing in a bar. So, I mean, this is a really sort of normal, conventional communication method. And you can see, I've overlaid these arrows on it, you can see what the visual path is here. You're meant to start at Mr. Gnome and drop into the illustration and the guitar is pushing you back up into the pertinent information and then back down into the location. So all of this, this sort of swirly visual path isn't a conventional one and it isn't something that you might have thought of as you, if you began this project, but it is what ended up being the effective visual path here. This has the exact same visual path. This chair follows, it has an entry point, it has a belt, big belly curve, and then it kind of curls back to where you started in the beginning. Um, so the movement in this chair isn't necessarily acting to put your attention anywhere. It's not necessarily meant to show you anything, but it's sort of meant to reinforce the use and the beauty and the, and, and the sort of aesthetic value of the chair. So it's the same movement and it's the same concept of movement, but its manifestation does different things. It has different purposes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this poster. This is a really famous poster. Um, it was done by a designer called Alexander Rychenko um, shortly after the Russian Revolution. And what's she shouting? Does anyone know what she's shouting? Is she saying books? <laughs> Because at that time, um, it was very important for the government to express to the, to the, to the newly sort of liberated pro proletariat how important it was to read and how important it was to become literate. They were promoting the idea of literacy. But that movement of the lines, so the origin point at her face, she has the origin point right here at her mouth, and then you have these strong lines radiating out of her mouth. These are all representations of movement. So she's not just saying books and she's not just speaking books to someone who's sitting next to her. She's shouting it. She's screaming it for as many people as possible can hear. And, and, and that's meant to be an exciting thing. That's meant to be an important thing. It gives some credence to the message. Movement doesn't always necessarily come from curved elements. In some instances, it's a matter of taking a grid and turning it. So in this case, for the Bauhaus design, all they did was take this grid and spin it. So they're straight, rigid lines, but their position is creating movement. It's creating interest. And sometimes movement is um, more layout based and is meant to sort of, again, reinforce that hierarchy. So we have this visual entry point. The blue is super helpful, right? Because it's this little shot of blue that's pushing you down into the only photographic element on the entire layout that's looking directly at the boldest typeface on the entire layout that literally has a line leading you to this big red square. So they're manipulating the visual path using this idea of movement. This is the Sydney Opera House um, in Australia. And these little um, sort of fins here um, are meant to create the idea of movement. And they're also meant to unify into the landscape because this opera house obviously sits um, on the water. So by using a more sort of organic form, a more sort of organic fish-like form, it's unifying itself to the landscape, to, that, to the sense of place of where it belongs. But by using a curved roof, it's also creating this idea and, and using these sort of radiating shapes, they get bigger and then they get smaller as they move out to the edges. It's creating this illusion of movement in a static concrete building. Rhythm, okay, I wanna see how we are on time. We're good on time, all right. Um, rhythm is the repetition or alternation of elements, um, often with defined intervals between them to create a sense of movement. It create pattern and texture, it can create emphasis. Rhythm is a, is a method of representation. So it does a lot of, most like everything else, it does a lot of different things. Um, this was the identity for the, the um, Mexico, 1968 Mexico Olympics. And if you look into Olympic history and the design a little bit, this was the first time that an Olympic identity was really intended to acknowledge the city in which it was being held. Um, so the designer, Lance Wyman, um, researched really heavily and found this sort of idea of pattern in Aztec art. Um, and, and we can talk about this when you come to Wilkes and we dig really deep into this, into this project, but because this is really one of the most iconic 
um, Olympic identities of all time. Um, so, but we can really start to see that radiative line, that sort of repeating line pattern does have an Aztec feel. It does sort of acknowledge the origin country that the Olympics are taking place in. So that rhythmic aspect of it was intended to send that particular kind of message. This is the cover of the annual report for the Canadian Broadcasting System for 1974. Um, so not a really interesting document, not a very sexy or cool or, or dynamic document. But the thing to notice is this illustration on the front. This is the logo for the Canadian Broadcasting Company. Uh, it was sli it's slightly modified for this purpose, but one reason that it might be really important to manifest movement in a print piece um, where it would normally not be something that would be easy to do is because this is a motion-based company. This is a broadcasting company. This logo is most identified in an animative format. It's animated, it, it blooms, it opens up, it, it moves. And that's the way most people knew it and continue to know it. So representing this logo in a motion sort of way by repeating those elements and sort of radiating them out, um, that allows us to perceive that motion that we're getting and, and um, we're getting on a screen that we're not getting in print. It also can be used to create emphasis. Um, you know, this, this, so this letter is about, this article is about the letter A. Well, the designer could have put a giant letter A on this page and you would absolutely have noticed it and have perceived it as an A. But rather than doing that, they created a pattern. They created a field of noise, A's, 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 and changed the color of one in the center to single it out. So all of that emphasis now still rests on that A, but it's a lot smaller than you might perceive it to be. And again, this stuff 100% exists in all medium executions. Here we're seeing a rhythmic execution in architecture. Um, all of these windows are, you know, probably functional. Some of them are, some of them aren't, but what it does is it creates a rhythmic design that allows this building to look a lot more dynamic, especially when the sun is shining off of it. When those, when those windows are being reflected back onto um, the building next to it or the water that's probably nearby. Um, all of these sort of aspects of repetition are a design element meant to enhance something. And they even exist in your regular, normal windows in your house. Um, these, these lines, these panels, they serve no function um, anymore. They used to be, you know, small glass panels with wood in between. Now this is purely for an, from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, but what it does is it's comforting, right? We're pattern seeking animals. We want to know what to expect. We want patterns are predictive in that way. So when we see something that's pattern based, we tend to be comforted by it. Space. A form exists in space. You need negative space to manifest positive space. They cannot exist without, uh, they cannot exist without one another. Uh, it's a symbiotic relationship. So when you have an illustration like this, this is a really great way to see and perceive and understand the idea of negative and positive space because without the trees on the bottom, the buildings don't exist. And without the buildings, the trees don't exist. Um, so in this particular instance, we can see that negative space is very much an active element and plays a very significant role in creating the success of this layout. You know, there's any number of reasons why you wouldn't want a human representation on a poster. Um, maybe you're trying to acknowledge that people of several different races or genders or different appearances are able to participate in a particular event. So rather than putting a person's face on here, they're using the negative space in between the violins to create the concept of a person, to create the idea of a person. So in this particular instance, the negative space, the idea that the, the, the area where there's nothing is the focal point of the image. It's the primary representation in the image. You know, it's negative space is actually really helpful in combining concepts. Um, here we're combining the idea of a home and a wrench. Seems like a really easy conclusion to come to, but how many different ways can this be used? A construction company, a real estate company, a tool builder, 
um, you know, a die maker, any number of things that someone might need of a mark that combines the idea of a home and a tool. Again, combining ideas, negative space is great for that. So here we're using the fork and the wine bottles to come together and to create this perception of the fork, but also acknowledging the wine. So anytime you're trying to combine two concepts together, negative space is a really great way to do that. This one is my favorite. If, you, if it's possible to have a favorite design principle, this one is my um, balance is the visual equilib equilibrium of the elements that causes a total image to appear balanced. And there's a few different kinds of balance. Um, this poster for this 127 hours is a representation of symmetrical balance, right? So these mountains, even though they're not identical, they are roughly the same proportion and size. Um, you know, this, these areas of negative space in the sky and the ground, again, not exactly the same, but roughly the same size and proportion. And then you have this sort of singular element in the middle. So everything in this layout is being driven towards a centered tension. The headline is centered, the text is centered, the primary interest in the image is centered. All of this, all of this symmetry and all of this balance is actively pushing into the middle here. Where here you have an example of asymmetrical balance. You have on one side, on the yellow side of this. Baba. Hello? Oh, um, on the left side of this illustration, on the left side of this image, you have some really detailed illustration um, with some spikes and some, some really scary looking imposing lasers and knives and things like that. On the opposite side, you don't have those complex and detailed illustrative elements, but what you do have is complex and detailed typography. So even though these are not the same element, and even though it's a diagonal, uh, a diagonal division, it's still a balanced layout. It's an asymmetrically balanced layout because the, the amount of text and the visual impact of the text is equal to the visual impact of the illustration. You know, but build, you know, ways, ways to make people more comfortable in interior design situations, creating symmetry and creating balance um, is a comforting space. So when you're in a meeting room or in you're in some, some sort of other, you know, uh, more corporate space where you might not necessarily feel comfortable, you'll see things are sort of rounded, things are sort of symmetrical, um, things are sort of very even, and that's meant to comfort you. You know, here's an example. I don't know if you've, if any of you guys have played Monument Valley. It's super dope. Um, I love it. Actually, my son plays it. Um, and the, there's so there's there's significant balance in the in the design of this layout in that the interest the the the, the complex um, you know illustration the, the the typography the sort of more complex perceptive elements are at the top. There's a division in the page, and then the more complex um, complicated illustrative elements are at the bottom. So again, they're not necessarily the same element. It's not a symmetrical balance, but the visual perception of these elements balances this page. And your front door, I mean, it, 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 like your front door is balanced, your, your home, the way you design things, the way you put two hanging baskets on, the, on your porch, the way you flank uh, you know, your, your home with pumpkins at, 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 Christmas, at, you know, at, um, excuse me, at Halloween. Um, all of these sort of symmetrical balanced elements are something that we as humans find comforting. We do that when, there's, when we're not even being told to do it. Um, so imagine creating a layout that someone is going to find and appeal to them using these concepts that we know as human beings we, 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 that if they appeal to us. Contrast, and that lies in the interaction of the contradictory elements. Um, when they're expressed as opposites, when they're expressed in a format that accentuates their duality. So you have these, these terms, I love you and I hate you. Um, rarely are you saying I hate you with some kind of, without some kind of emphasis, right? You're usually shouting it, you're usually angry about it, you usually feel really strongly about it um, and passionate about it. So they're using Helvetica, but a bold version of Helvetica to express that hate versus a same typeface, same, same font, different design. So it's an it's a, it's a ultra light version of Helvetica to say something different, to say I love you, which is usually softer, it's more delicate, it's more 
um, meaningful. It's not as it's not as aggressive or angry. Um, so the contrast of these two typefaces is really sort of reinforcing those messages, is reinforcing the anger of hating and the sort of delicacy of loving. In this case, um, contrast, it's contrast between the methods of execution. You have the detailed element of the gentleman up the top. You, he's wearing his hat. The sun is shining on his face. He's reading a paper. He's smiling. Um, and then obviously down at the bottom, we see he's sitting in a chair, but we don't get a ton of detail because of the way the illustration changes. So those contrasts are what's letting us see very clearly that he's got a Coke sitting next to him. And it's letting us see very clearly that he's happy. We don't have all of this distraction down here to take us away from those concepts. So those contrasting elements are really helping us with our messaging. This one I include because of its contrast, not necessarily in color or anything else, but its contrast in line quality. So right here we have a very old, very rigid style of type, right? We've got New York Historical Society and this very old style serif, all caps, typeface. Um, and then sort of cutting through it and jetting through it, you have this bright, colorful, um, organic, you know, really motion heavy illustration that's jumping through that really rigid type. So that idea of contrast is what's creating the visual interest here. Um, more so than if it were just sort of the illustration next to the type, those two elements being separate and them interacting with each other. Emphasis. This one's a little bit harder to describe how it's different from hierarchy, um, but hopefully the examples are going to help. Um, th they can be created using just one of the elements of design, but most of the time you're using hierarchy, you're using rhythm, you're using all of the other elements that we've sort of talked about to create emphasis. So here we're using this concept of hierarchy. We're making one thing bigger and another thing smaller. We're emphasizing one of the elements. But here we're using things like color and arrows, right? So we're using this blue to emphasize the logo because everything else in the, in the, in the image is, is a little bit more devoid of color. Um, here we're using this yellow arrow to sort of, using the color in the, in the image and then the arrow to sort of point back at where you begin on the page. So in addition to size, color, shape, position, layout, all of these things can be used to create emphasis. Here the emphasis is a little bit more subtle. Um, obviously the idea is that this is a relief organization. These people have encountered a really difficult situation and there's someone coming in to help. Um, they're using the check over their heads to sort of block the rain. So that's the concept here but we're using different aspects of image creation to create emphasis. Um, the fact that this young lady is wearing red and her mom is wearing pink, these are not mistakes. Um, those aren't just happenstance. Those are specific wardrobe choices from the art direction of the photo that are made to create emphasis. You can see that this area here is where the sky is clearing and you can see like the, the light is sort of coming through and it's, it's not a mistake that it's right above their heads. We're creating, we're using the photograph and we're using art direction to create emphasis on the central figure. Um, so from a layout standpoint, we know exactly where we're supposed to be looking. Now here is a still um, from a game that is using this light to create emphasis on the primary character. And in that instance, that's probably a symptom of storytelling. So these characters, you can see their faces aren't real specific. They kind of have like masks or something obscuring them. Um, and then this young man is wearing red. The light is shining directly on him. That's signaling to our brain that he's an important character. He's a main character. He's someone that we want to pay attention to. He's someone that we're interacting with. It's a, it's a fast signal and it's not something that you'll necessarily acknowledge. You'll be like, oh, he's wearing red. I'm supposed to pay attention to him. Your brain is doing this really, really quickly. Um, but the person that was creating this image, the person that was creating these assets, knew that they had to put that emphasis element onto that character so that you would understand that character's importance. This is one that I include that's really hard to perceive without context. Um, but this is an image that I saw when I was scrolling through my Instagram feed. And 
this was all it was. If you if you clicked through the image, there was a, it was an image carousel where you could see like how to make a margarita or whatever. It was a, it was like a drink recipe. Um, but this was the this orange square was the only real image that you saw initially on the post. And imagine, if you will, your social media feed and how quickly you scroll through it and how an orange, a bright orange screen like this would serve to just kind of stop you in your tracks and create emphasis on the post that they want you to look at. So Quantrell is using emphasis, not necessarily in their own layout, but they're using emphasis with the way they're designing this panel, knowing how it's going to be absorbed in context, knowing how you're gonna see it in social media. And this is the last slide I have, so I can stop yakking at your faces for now. I'm sure you're probably sick of hearing my voice. Um, but this slide is a, an album um, design for jazz percussion. And so it's not some, look at all of these different artists. There's all these different artists that are contributing to this album. So it's not necessarily that you can put someone's picture on it, they all play different instruments, so you can't necessarily put uh, with one singular instrument on it. But by pinching in that type and by reshaping that typography, they're serving to create emphasis in the layout, and they're pushing you back to the middle, which brings you down into this visual path. So emphasis in, in service of layout, that's another sort of manifestation of why emphasis is important. So I'm going to stop the share right now. Um, and we're back to this fun view here. Does anybody have any questions? I just told you tons of stuff. I just threw, like I said, sophomore level information at you in a tenth of the amount of time that I would normally take to explain that to somebody. Um, so does anyone have any questions? I'm pretty good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I guess I was just wondering, is there, like at any point, will you be doing more of like a character design type of art or something like that, like environmental design and like so things a, like that? Right. A big part of our program, a big way that our program works um, is that you get sort of foundational education in the beginning. So we're talking about really broad themes here, like color and light source and layout and composition and sort of all of those big ideas. And then everybody kind of splits off um, usually at the end of your sophomore year, roughly, is when you kind of have a better idea of, of what, your, what your medium execution choice is. Um, everyone sort of splits off, and then they use what they learned about color, about light source, about composition, about all of those aspects in whatever kind of area that they choose. So, for instance, right now we have, not, uh, we have 11 seniors graduating this year. Um, some of them are graphic designers and typographers. I have two students who work primarily in 3D and motion art. Um, doc, you know, I have one of those students has, a, has two projects in his portfolio of character design and rendering. So he designed characters for two fictitious video games. Um, the, another student has a world that he created. Um, you know, it's not being used in game for any specific purpose right now, of course, but he designed the buildings, he designed the landscape and the foliage and the, you know, all of the materials. So, so we have students that are customizing sort of what their interests are based off of you know, what's important to them, but still everybody's learning the same kind of design principles and concepts and all of these things contribute to those, those aspects. Yeah, that's really neat. Yeah, it's exciting. And I mean, that's like I said, it's a great segue into Dr. Ren because that's really one of the great things about our program is as we grow our program, our program is very young. It's only, I think, 15 years old, um, which is comparatively pretty young for, for design programs. Um, but what's really exciting about it is the direction that we're growing it and the direction that we're moving it is more in the direction of um, new media, emerging technologies, um, different sort of methods of execution, because what we're finding in the graphic design space is that all of our ideas are being manifested in that way. I mean, if I am, you know, if I'm designing a, the interior of a retail space, I'm absolutely working with interactive designers, game designers, 3D artists, all of these people to bring that to life because I'm going to be using those digital technologies in my designs. Um, so what we really focus on at Wilkes is providing you with a toolkit and, and trying to give you as many sort of um, options to be able to make what you want to make, but make sure that you're making it soundly and making sure that you're making it with the right kind of graphic ideas and principles and, you know, artistic 
uh, foundations in mind. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I did. Thank you. Um, Andy, I, or Dr. Ren, I don't know if you wanted to talk, to, um, just tell, tell these guys a little bit about some of the classes that um, are involved in the, in the Emerging Technologies minor. Sure. Uh, any of you gamers out there? That's what I was. <laughs> yeah? What, what games do you typically play? Uh, I've been playing a lot of Apex Legends right now. Oh, Apex. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, cool, cool. I just started playing some Fallout actually recently. Uh, oh, Fallout New Vegas. Okay. I guess this is a good time for, you know, staying at home. And <laughs> yeah, sessions. definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to introduce you um, our new minor, um, Game Design and Emerging Technology. Uh, we actually have designed a series of courses, a total of 18 credits, covering the area of game history, design, and implementation, along with the uh, emerging technology courses, such as you know, VR and AR. Any of you are familiar with AR and VR? I've heard of VR. I've never heard of AR. I've heard of VR. I've never heard of AR. Never heard of AR? Yes, you have. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. It's a different name. Uh, so VR is something that's completely virtual. It doesn't involve any of the uh, real world object. But AR is some like you mix uh, the virtual objects with the real world environment. I'm pretty sure you guys seen AR. Oh yeah, I've, is it new? Is this kind of, is it kind of like a new technology? It's, it's kind of new. Um, Did you yeah, let's give you a now? simple example. What about Pokemon Go? Yeah, I've played that like a while. Like that's a while that's ago. AR because you AR. mix oh, okay. the virtual <laughs> object with the real world environment. So oh, that's right. AR. Yep. So uh, this this minor is actually um, approved just by the uh, curriculum committee this semester. And it will be fully launched in the uh, fall 2020 semester, which is next semester. So, I mean, when you think about some of the practical applications of something like that, like, you know, we've seen it with Pokemon Go, that's where we're used to seeing it in our lives. Um, but imagine, you know, industry, real estate, uh, manufacturing, um, you know, retail, all of the different sort of industries that can deploy some application of that technology. Sure. Can, can you guys think of anything? I mean, there, you could probably use that for a, a lot of ways. Maybe even Sorry. people with like assistive, uh, I don't know. I mean, go into a foreign country and then you can somehow have an app that like can read the icons for you like that or something. Something yeah, like that yeah. to like display things. I feel like there could yeah, be a lot like of things a, that you open up an app and it translate like you hover over your yeah, camera, yeah. And it'll have like icons of like food or something if you can't right, like understand right. it. And also um think about the furniture stores. Like you can put virtual uh, furnitures on, on your room to kind of test it out, like where you want to arrange your furniture. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's I like the same. So yeah, so we have a total of 18 credits, um, basically covering you know anything from game design to VR. And uh, we had this idea of establishing this game design matter for quite a while uh, because the media art and game design are very closely tied to each other. And designing a game is, is a creative process and it not only needs programmers, but also artists so they can collaborate and make this happen. And another reason is the high demand in the current gaming industry. And according to Google Trends, the video game industry has been experiencing a huge growth for a few years now. And this means that jobs are opening up all over the place for video game designers, developers, animators, and 3D modelers. And the next five years will definitely look promising for students who are interested in, in a game design career. So this minor is intended to prepare you for a range of interactive visualization positions in game design, production, visualization, engineering, manufacturing, also 3D simulation and other uh, content creation environment. 
And when you think about um, game design, you know, when you have this game design principles, you can actually apply that to many different areas, like serious gaming, for example. Uh, you can design a maybe like a virtual hospital settings to train, um, you know, doctors, surgeons. You can also design like, you know, car simulator for you know, driving experiences a fly simulator to train the pilots. So there's many ways that you can use uh, the game design principles for, for a more serious purposes. So that's why we create this you know, game design manual and, and emerging technology for you to, to equip you with multiple skills, not only in you know, programming, but also in designing. So that's pretty much the overview of what we have right now. And do you guys have any questions about this new minor or game design in general? So is is the this minor and everything, is that all on your website? Can yeah. I just access uh, it's, that? It's, 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 it's not currently on the website yet because it, it was just approved by the curriculum committee, but it will be on the website uh, in the summer. Sometimes oh, okay. in the summer. Yep. Any other um, questions I can answer? I mean, um, I think, go ahead. I was just thinking, uh, I guess I was just wondering, uh, what would, uh, you know, after uh, college and everything look like? Is there any type of job placement or, or, or things like that? Or? Yeah, there's there's actually tons of uh, up job opportunities. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, there's like game designers, 3D modelers, and even 3D simulations. Uh, there's like gaming engine developers, all even sorts on of. The design end, I mean, our yeah. job market is excellent right now. Um, you know, all of our all of our last year's class is working in industry. Um, oh wow. Yeah, they, they we mm -hmm. they, last year was a really good class, <laughs> and and this year's I mean we have a I have a student who just did he interviewed with the Kansas City Chiefs, um, he interviewed with like a, hu a huge esports company out in Seattle. Oh wow! Um, in the last couple of weeks, so so we're seeing some really good um, job markets out there right now. Now of course that changes mm -hmm. quickly, <laughs> um, but philosophically I think for us it's really important that you're versatile when you leave our program. Um, you know, we have students with the same degree, went through the same sequence of classes. One of them's a photographer, one of them's, you know, a videographer, one of them's doing print design work, one of them's doing, you know, motion and animation. So, you know, I think for us, we feel as though you're more marketable, you're more likely to get a job, you're more likely to build a lasting career that you love. Um, mm -hmm. if you have a big toolkit to work from, if you know how yeah. to execute a lot of different things, um, because campaigns right now, everyone is looking at like 360 sort of multimedia execution. Like if you're Oreo, you're putting out print content, you're putting out TV commercials, you're putting out social content. Maybe you have a game on your website where you shoot little Oreo things out of the sky and get points or something. All everyone is looking at sort of a 360 execution on on the way they're doing their creative. Um, so for us, no matter how the job market behaves, the more skills that you have and the more sort of opportunities you have, the better chance you have when you get out of here. Right. So we're here to equip you with multiple skills. You know, like mm -hmm. when you go out, you know, not only you can prove them, but you can also design. Yeah. Yeah. Hugely important. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're about at the end of our time with you guys. Um, and I, I mean, if you have any other questions, if you have anything you think of after we get off the call or just something you didn't want to ask publicly, both uh, Dr. Renz and my emails and Eric's as well are published um, on the Wilkes website. Please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions. I know this is a super weird time um, and nothing's really going the way you want it to. But <laughs> But, you know, we want to, it's not going to be like this forever. And we want to make sure you're making the right choice, you know, when you're, when you're picking a school, it's a big decision.
Um, so make sure you reach back out if there's any other questions that we can answer. Yes, that sounds great. I only, I think the only other question I have else is that, so when could I like actually switch my um, thing to that minor? Okay, so that's, uh, minors are built into, is that a cognate, Andy? Cognate, yeah. It's a cognate, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, cognate minors are built into our curriculum. Um, so everybody okay. comes in taking the same courses and then about at your sophomore year is when we start to, to choose your classes based on what you think you might want to do for your minor. Um, you don't actually like declare it. You sign a paper and declare it. At the oh, okay, end okay. Yeah, I don't know really anything about this stuff. No, so. no, that's okay. That's okay. I, mean, <laughs> I didn't either until I started teaching in this program. <laughs> but yeah, so so you'll be you'll be taking the same foundational courses as everybody, and then at the end of your okay. sophomore year is when we sort of start to advise. Oh, okay. So then classes that go with the minor. Oh, okay. So in my sophomore year, then I'll be able to choose that kind of. Kind of, yeah, of but like, but yeah, and we do that just so that you know you get that first year foundational, yeah, to sort of be sure, you know, of, of what direction you want to take. Yeah, right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that cleared that up a lot. One yeah, of us yeah. will be your advisor, and um, you will find out down the road. Yeah, I think, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm the academic advisor yeah. for all incoming freshmen, so that will will get you all the courses you need to get. But yeah, those some of some of the emergent technologies courses are a little on the higher, like they're 200 level courses. Um, so you got to get There's those. There's a 200 level, mostly 300 level. Yeah, so you got to get those foundational mm -hmm. ones out of the way first. Got you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Guys, again, thank you so much for coming. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. And I hope you, you know, you enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.